question for you. This is kind of a silly question, but have you ever been really hungry? I'm guessing we can all say that we have been, right? Uh, there's a few people in my life that are always hungry. Uh, the first one is not actually a person at all. Um, it is my dog, Penny. Okay, and before you do your Oz and, you know, she is very adorable, but don't let her fool you. She is as slippery as a snake. <laughs> a few weeks ago, um, I just got home from a, a youth gathering, youth meeting, um, and I made myself a perfectly sliced, perfectly spread, perfectly portioned peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It was one of my best. Um, I put it down on the table and I remembered that I had forgotten my sparkling millennial water, which is my term for flavored seltzer water. So I went into the kitchen to get it. I was gone for maybe, I don't know, maybe five seconds. I came back and half of my masterpiece between two slices of bread was gone. There's another couple people that are always hungry. Parents, you know what I'm talking about. My two kids are always hungry. If you're in our house for even a few minutes, you will hear this phrase, two words, I'm hungry. Um, and, you know, uh, it, it's used so often that I think we could probably put a techno beat under uh, that phrase and make like a ton of money off a, uh, off a viral song, all the money going to Northridge Church, of course. <laughs> um, but yeah, so three other people in my life that are always hungry. You might have guessed this, but it is me, myself, and I. I am constantly, without fail, hungry, very much so, even now. And so I'm hoping that the man delivering the message would just hurry up and get on with it. So here we go. Uh, we're talking about hunger today, if you were wondering. Um, and Jesus experienced hunger. We're going to see that in our text today. So we're going to jump right in. Matthew 4, if you want to follow along with me uh, in your Bible or device that has a Bible on it. Matthew 4, starting in verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. As my brother in the rhythm section, Steve Leonard, would say, that is one of the biggest understatements ever. <laughs> he then became hungry. So we've got a lot to cover here, but I want us to just feel the weight for a second. Stop and feel the weight of that statement. He then became hungry. Jesus the word who was God, who was with God, who is God, through whom God the Father created the entire universe and by whom all things are upheld by the word of his power. Have you thought about that? He's sustaining you and me. He's sustaining the whole universe by the word of his power. And he emptied himself to experience hunger to experience thirst, to experience pain, to experience suffering, to experience temptation, and ultimately, death on a cross. What humble obedience flowing out of his love for God the Father, and what bold sacrifice flowing out of his love for you and for me. Is he worthy, church? Yes, yes he is worthy to receive, as my brother said earlier, my brother Rob, to receive power, wealth, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, and after he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And I entered in that slide, so the fact that days is not plural is my fault. All of us face temptation. Temptation to take matters into our own hands instead of waiting on God's plan. Temptation to indulge in the temporary pleasures of sin instead of looking to God who in his right hand has pleasures forevermore. Temptations to bow the knee to idols 
instead of fearing the one true God. The question is not whether we will face temptation, it's when we'll face temptation. You notice that the devil tempts Jesus when in, he's in his weak, most weak and vulnerable position, extreme hunger. Have you noticed that he often chooses to make his attacks when we're at our weakest points? It's important for us to not be ignorant of his schemes, but also to not fear his attacks. Because even though we walk through the darkest valley, our shepherd is with us to care for us. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And the strength of our father is made perfect in our weakness. Hallelujah. Yeah. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. Why does God, the Holy Spirit, lead Jesus into the wilderness? Have you ever wondered that? Well, I hate to disappoint you, but I really don't know the full answer. I don't understand all of why God's Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. I have a few opinions, but I'm not going to share my opinions because I don't think that's why I'm here today. But I do know that part of why Jesus emptied himself to become fully human and to experience temptation was so that he could face temptation just like us. I love the book of Hebrews Hebrews chapter 2, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants." For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. If you believe that is good news, church, can I hear you say good news? Yes, that is awesome. We've all faced temptation and we've all fallen to it and we've sinned. The penalty of that sin is death. The penalty for choosing our way over God's way, for rebelling against him and hurting ourselves and others in the process. The penalty is death. But Jesus came to be our perfect high priest, to make atonement for our sins by offering himself as the perfect sacrifice to take away our sins. In order to do that, in order to live and to die, he had to become human. He had to become in every respect like us, and that includes temptation. How glorious is the truth that Jesus, because he suffered as we've suffered temptation, he's able to help us when we're being tempted. More on that later. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Notice, church, that it's not God doing the tempting. We know from the book of James that it's not God who tempts us. The Spirit led him into the wilderness. God is in charge. He is on the throne. Nothing happens apart from his permission. But the tempter here is the devil. The same one who threw the serpent in the garden tempted Adam to mistrust God and to directly disobey him is now tempting the second Adam. Jesus, but where the first Adam failed, the second Adam would succeed. Jesus would face temptation victoriously by trusting in his Father's word, provision, presence, and plan. And we can trust him too. You see, right before 
the Spirit led Jesus in the water to, into the water, into the wilderness to be tempted. I was thinking of baptism. Jesus, in humblest submission to the Father, was baptized. There we go. And he heard beautiful words of his Father, validating who he was as his treasured son. He trusted his Father's words. Matthew 3. After he was baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and resting on him. And behold, a voice from the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. I said water, and then I was thirsty. So the Gospel of Mark tells us that immediately after this bright, monumental experience in Jesus' life, he is led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, 40 days later, the enemy could have tempted him before this time, but we're, we're seeing things 40 days later. 40 days later, Jesus is very hungry, and the devil takes advantage of that. Verse 3. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So here's another scheme of the enemy. First scheme was... He comes at Jesus when he's weak. Second scheme is he tries to get Jesus to question his identity. He's been doing that ever since. It's not new that he's trying to get us to question our identity as daughters and sons of God. If you are the son of God, he says, I believe what he's getting at is if you really are the son of God, if God really meant what he said, then prove it right now. But Jesus had nothing to prove. He trusted that his father meant what he said because his father was perfectly trustworthy. One of my favorite passages in all of scripture, every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Jesus took refuge in his father's word. He believed his father would be a shield. He believed the words of his father, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He believed those were true because every word of God proves true. Is that right, church? Yeah. We can trust his word. His word that always proves true Jesus utilizes his word as an offensive weapon against the enemy. In fact, he quotes God's word. He quotes scripture three times here, and they can all be found in the book of Deuteronomy. I think Jesus liked the book of, De uh, of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, uh, about 90% of that book is Moses' final address. It's a very long address. To Israel, it's right after their 40 years in the wilderness, and it's right before they cross over the Jordan River into the promised land. And so um, Jesus quotes these words, these words that God spoke through Moses. And it's interesting, if you read Deuteronomy 8, some of the words that Moses speaks over the Israelites are very similar, actually remarkably mirror. Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness. Check this out. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way into the wilderness these 40 years. Jesus led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days. To humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known. To teach you that man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So here in Deuteronomy 8, Moses is giving Israel the answer to the question, why? Which is really solid leadership. It helped that God was speaking through him, of course. 
He's telling them why God led them through the wilderness. It was to humble them, to test them, to see if they would keep his commands, and also to teach them their need for God and his word. Well, we all know the story, right? Israel's time in the wilderness is unfortunately a story of failure. Failure to keep God's commands and depend on him. And where the Israelites failed in the wilderness and where we have all failed in the wilderness of this broken world, Jesus succeeded. The father had led his son into the wilderness by the spirit. He let his son go hungry and Jesus trusted his father's provision that was soon to come. He didn't take matters into his own hands because he trusted the words of his father. He did not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes out of his father's mouth. And he used these words like a sword to cut through the corrupt logic of the enemy. The psalmist says, I have hidden your words in my heart that I might not sin against you. Church, let's follow Jesus in this. Let's regularly feast on the word of God. Let's meditate on it and let's memorize it so we can use it as an offensive weapon against the enemy's lies. Jesus trusted his father to provide. And so many times we fall prey to temptation because we don't believe that God is going to provide. But our father is perfectly trustworthy. We can trust his provision. I struggled to believe this fact for over a decade of my Christian life. Falling prey to temptation and getting stuck in a sin addiction that I couldn't escape. Every time I'd fall into sin, I'd confess my sin to God and say, God, I'm going to do better for you this time. I'm going to do so much better for you. I was missing the whole point that what God started with his spirit, where I was born again by the spirit, how could I ever think that I could walk out this Christian life apart from the work of the Spirit. That's logic from Galatians. I didn't make that up. I needed someone to share that truth with me. And that someone was actually Pastor Dan. It's the first message I ever heard from him, and it was a very motivational message. It was basically quit, which was exactly what I needed to hear. Quit trying to do on your own strength what only God can do through you. That was a transformational moment for me. And as I slowly started to, instead of saying, God, I'm going to do it better for you, but started to say, God, I can't do this. Help me. Live your life through me. As I started to surrender my struggle with sin to him, he began to do a work in me, and I began to see his freedom. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And church, I want to encourage you that when you're tempted, the temptation is not sin. The enemy would like you to believe and would like you to walk in guilt and shame that that temptation is you sinning. It is not. Jesus, as we know in Hebrews 4, was tempted in every way like us except without sin. So church, when we are tempted, we are not sinning, and we don't have to sin. Isn't that beautiful? Because Jesus is with us. One of my favorite passages that has been a constant comfort for me um, in my dealing with temptation, in facing temptation, is 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except something common to mankind. And God is faithful, so he will not allow you be, to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. I've seen time and time again 
when facing temptation, if I stop and just ask God, show me the way of escape, he does time and time again. Sometimes it's worshiping him. Often and almost always it's scripture related because that's how Jesus dealt with temptation. It could also be do some push-ups or go on a run. Like it doesn't have to be this over-spiritual thing, right? But there is also, there is always a way of escape that God gives us from temptation. I believe that. He always provides. Matthew 4, verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So here's another scheme. The enemy takes scripture out of context. He takes a little piece of scripture and throws it at us. And often I don't think it's actually the devil himself. I think it's his demons. But um, anyway, that's another point. (laughs) That's not what we're dealing with right now. But Jesus quotes scripture right back at the enemy. He uh, is interpreting scripture in the context of all of scripture, right? And so the enemy just takes a little portion of Psalm 91 out. And then Jesus is like, yeah, but it says this in Deuteronomy chapter 6. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massa. Good old Massa. It's a perfect word to use if you want to get biblical in a poem or a rap about NASA. And it's also a place where Israel set camp during their time in the wilderness. At Massa, we read in Exodus 17, the Israelites were thirsty and without water, and so they did what they do, and what we do a lot, they complained. They grumbled against Moses, saying, why is it that you have brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Ultimately, as scripture reveals, their beef wasn't just with Moses, it was with God. And they tested God in their grumbling, saying, is the Lord among us or not? God's word from Psalm 95, 9 says that they tested me though they had seen my work. Although they had seen God come through time and time again, they tested him by saying, God, are you really here? Are you really here among us? Israel failed to trust God's presence with them, but Jesus trusted that his father was with him, even in his darkest hour. Do you remember when Jesus cried out to God? In Psalm, well, sorry, in, um, on the cross, right? He was nailed to the cross, experiencing the horrible bodily mortification of, cross, of crucifixion He's also experiencing the beyond overwhelming weight of our sin being born in his body on the cross, right? Jesus on the cross, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Had God left him in that moment? No, because I know that Jesus knew the whole truth of Psalm 22. It says, in Psalm twenty-two, twenty-four, 24, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. Jesus never mistrusted God's presence with him. But there in his darkest hour, with his final breath, he cries out on the cross, Father, into your hands. I commit my spirit. And of and of saying this, 
he breathed his last. So we go through those dark valleys and there is a place for prayers of lament. Just like Jesus prayed that prayer of lament from Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But even in our darkest hours, we can trust that God is very present. He's with us always. Jesus, the end of Matthew, the very last phrase of Matthew, he comforts his disciples, he comforts all, all of us with this word. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I had a brother in Christ encourage me to meditate on just this section of Matthew 28. Uh, I am with you always to, to the end of the age. So I wrote it down on a note card, put it in my wallet, and then because I'm very forgetful, um, I put a note in my phone just to remind me once a day to look at that. Uh, it was really encouraging. I have like a whole list of things God was revealing by just dwelling on this, letting him speak to me through it. But one passage that came up as a result of that was Psalm 46.1. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. The Father and Jesus are one. Jesus promises that he will be with us always. Because Jesus is with us always, the Father is with us always. And he is an ever-present help in time of trouble. Isn't that wonderful? Let me just pray real quick. Father, we believe. Help us in our unbelief. Open the eyes of our hearts to see that you are right there with us. When we face temptation, you are faithful. You will not abandon us in our time of need. Even in our darkest hour, you are our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. God, and direct us through the end of this message. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him. We know that he left him looking for another opportune time from the book of Luke. And behold, angels came and were ministering to him. What a sweet provision there by the Father. So here again, we see Jesus succeeding where Israel failed. Do you remember the golden calf incident? Exodus 32, Moses has gone up to the mountain to meet with God and to receive instruction from God on how they were to live. Also, the tabernacle they were to set up so that they could host God's presence in their midst. Well, he's taken a little bit too long. The Israelites are hungry. They want their Chipotle because uh, they're getting hungry. Um, but you can cancel your Chipotle orders today because... Uh, I clock this message, it's about three hours. Just kidding. Um, so the Israelites got restless in waiting for Moses to return, so they took matters into their own hands and convinced Aaron, who just so happened to be the soon-to-be high priest of Israel, to make for them another god to worship. Uh, and then Aaron's like, yeah, I just threw it in there, and out pops this golden calf. It was amazing. They failed time and time again to follow God's command to worship him and serve him only. And before we get on the Israelites in the wilderness, we need to look at ourselves. We haven't necessarily made golden calves, but we have set up our idols of self, possessions, relationships, leadership, traditions, work, hobbies, gifts, talents, vacations, and the list goes on. Yes, we have all bowed the need to idols and experienced the emptiness that comes from
from serving a false god. And I don't really list all of those things to point the finger at anybody else. Those are all gods that I've set up in my life. I know I've numerous times set up idols in my life without even realizing it. But praise be to God, Jesus never fell to the sin of idolatry. Isn't that good news? He followed and served only one master and trusted solely in his plan. He was ready to go through temptation and later the horrors of the cross in obedience of his father to save his people, to save Israel, and to save all of us from our sins. He died, but he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead. And I love what a biblical scholar R.T. France points out in his commentary of Matthew. He points out that Jesus, after trusting in God's plan, after raising from the dead, he sits, stands on a mountain, and he declares that all authority and power on heaven and on earth, what the enemy could never give, right? All authority and power on heaven and on earth is mine. Just like Jesus, we can trust in God's plan. We can trust in his plan when we are tempted to take shortcuts, to take matters into our own hands. We can trust that his plan is always better. But it can be hard to trust God's plan. Can you guys agree with me on that? Sometimes it can be really hard, especially when you're in the midst of that plan unfolding. I remember I had a plan for my life. Um, I was going to be a professional drummer. Um, and so, uh, I love drumsticks, they're awesome. Um, but yeah, I had this plan. I'm gonna be a professional drummer, so I was on that track. Um, I was in a band already. Uh, we were uh, playing at a packed out youth retreat of like 20 students. Um, and <laughs> it was great, it was a lot of fun. Uh, the, there's probably more than that, but yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, and one of those nights after we had just played uh, a worship set, I remember uh, just taking some time to talk with God. Um, I had my eyes closed and I was just listening and a picture came to mind. It was me with drumsticks in my hand, giving them up to God. And I was like, what's the deal with this? Like, why would you give me this gift? Why would you give me such a passion for this? Why do I feel like almost closest to you when I'm playing drums? Why would you take this away from me? And I didn't really want to surrender it, but I knew that my life did not belong to me, right? I knew I was not my own. I'd been bought with a price. And so I was like, sheepishly, uh, yeah, God, you can have them, you know? Um, man, I'm so glad that I put drums in his hands. I'm so glad I put that gift in his hands because his plan was far better, right? I, I came to find out many years later, his plan was not to take drums away from me, but it was for them to be in their rightful place under his feet, right? He alone has the throne of my heart. Drums can't take that. And if drums were to be the master of my life, I would be down a path of destruction that would hurt me and those around me. God saved me from that. And he gave me something even better. He led me to this wonderful church where I get the high privilege of pointing our students to Jesus, encouraging them in their walk with Jesus, and also I get to play drums almost every Sunday which is a blessing in my life. It can also be hard to trust in God's plan when we're in the midst of suffering. I think Joseph could really understand this one. Uh, we have some amazing uh, Sunday morning Bible uh, teachers. They've been teaching our students, our middle school and high school students for over a decade, Drew and Emily Holdren. Um, and they're leading them through the life of Joseph. And man, Joseph went through the ringer. Sold into slavery by his own brothers, 
wrongfully accused by his master's wife and then thrown into prison. Although it might not seem like it, Scripture reminds us that God was with Joseph working his plan out the whole time. And it was only many years later that a much older Joseph could look back on everything and in full forgiveness of his brothers say this to them. As for you, talking to his brothers, you meant evil for me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to keep many people alive. The story of Joseph points to Jesus who would be sold out by one of his very own dear disciples, wrongfully accused and sentenced to death on a cross. We may not always understand why God is doing what he is doing, but we can trust that he works all things together for the good of us, his followers, who love him and are called according to his purpose. It's so comforting to know that the one who trusted our Father's word, provision, plan, and presence perfectly is with us wherever we go. And church, the same God who calls Jesus his beloved son is the same God who has always had a perfect plan to adopt us so that we who call on the name of Jesus could be his daughters and sons too. I love this passage. We'll end with this. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we could do a whole message on those three verses, but we're not going to. Our Father loves us so much that he had a perfect plan before the foundation of the world that through Jesus' perfect sacrifice, all of us who believe in Jesus as Lord would be brought back home to him to be adopted into his own family. The perfect Father who loves us dearly is the same one who has unlimited ability to care for all of our needs and desires. We can trust him. When we're in the midst of temptation, we can trust our Father's word, provision, presence, and plan because he is trustworthy and he treasures us. Would you join me in prayer, church? Father, I thank you that we can trust you even in the midst of the strongest temptation when we are the weakest we can we can trust that your strength is made perfect in our weakness we can trust in your word we can trust that you will provide we can trust in your presence and we can trust in your plan i don't want to move from this moment um, without giving an invitation to anyone who has never made that first step to trust in god's plan God treasures each one of you. He treasures us so much that while we were still sinners, he demonstrated that love by sending Christ to die for us. And if you don't know Jesus today, I want to encourage you that today you can call out to him to be saved. You can call out to him and say, Jesus my life is yours. I believe you died. I believe that you rose from the dead. I believe that you are here. I entrust my life into your care. And I believe the truth of Scripture, when we confess Jesus as Lord, when we believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we experience salvation. We experience being born again into God's family. Father, I pray for all of us who have put our trust in Jesus. Empower us each day to take up our cross, follow you, surrender to the filling of your spirit so that we can walk in trust and in victory over temptation and sin and be able to love you and love those around us. 
In Jesus' name, amen.